Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to I Wonders uh, monthly webinars. I am Shaurav Shom. Uh, I currently work as a faculty at the Bhopal campus of Azim Premji University. Before this, I used to work as a teacher and teacher educator at the Azim Premji Foundation. And I am also part of the editorial committee of Iwanda. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I Wonder is a science magazine for middle and high school teachers. It features writings about the many dimensions of uh, teaching and learning science in class and outside it. It is published in English, Hindi, and Kannada to ICER. If you are a practicing science teacher, we invite you to write for us. And to do this, please send your ideas in less than 100 words to I wonder at apu.edu.in. And if you would like to receive updates of uh, each webinar and a free print version of each issue, subscribe to us by following the link displayed in the description of this video. You can also catch us on Facebook. On the second Wednesday of every month, like today, uh, we invite authors of an uh, article in I Wonder for a live discussion. Uh, for today's webinar, we have with us Barun Sharma. And uh, Barun has a PhD in uh, social work from the University of Delhi. A crucial part of his research pertains to human-animal relation so, uh, seen from a historical perspective. He is also the author of the article Nature's Passionate and Meticulous Chronicler from the December 2022 issue uh, of I Wonder. Barun, thank you for joining us. Sure, sure. Thank you, Saurav. The pleasure is mine as well. Yeah. So, uh, thanks. So, before we start, uh, let me give our audience a brief overview of the format of the discussion. Barun, I'll begin by asking you some questions uh, to delve deeper into the, your article. These questions are framed by the editors. Uh, I request everyone who has joined us today uh, to type their questions in the chat box. I will then try to weave in these questions from the audience as we continue our conversation. So, Barun, first thing, uh, let us start with the format of the article. Uh, why did you choose to write a biography? Uh, actually, uh, uh, sort of, there's no way of explaining, answering this question without without going into my my uh, beginnings as an academician. So, in the early phase of my work, which was largely historical, I wrote in a way which was very keenly attuned and paid a lot of focus to political and social contexts. And it was perhaps under the influence of certain theories or probably my mentors, I always had this tendency of kind of trying to show that people are defined by their contexts. So larger social contexts define the decisions human beings and individuals take. But in the course of writing like this, there was always this opposite temptation or this opposite, uh, or you know, this, this desire to explore an opposite uh, way of writing things, in which I want to see how individuals, rather than being defined by their times, could actually define their times. How individuals could actually give shape to their social and political contexts and set the ball rolling in a certain direction. And I felt that this biography suddenly gave me the opportunity to do it. And uh, I pitched a couple of ideas and the biography was one of them. And the editors were more interested in the biography. And it, it's, it's helped me to fulfill a wish of mine. So uh, that is interesting. So what guidelines uh, did you keep in mind? while writing this biography and uh, while, like I, I operated with a certain set of basic ethics it's a very short piece one was it would be very true to biography biographical facts and uh, just to have a sense of the chronology of events the trajectory and uh, to keep dates very clearly etched out in my mind when i'm writing which event happened when and uh, the second thing was not to come to any kind of early assumptions so if you read a piece in which say you know uh, m krishnan is talking about how the spotted dove does not conform to what Dadan said about it. Uh, he felt that you know, the spotted dove is an exception to the, the, the very famous rule of the survival of the fittest, as, as explained by Darwin. When you come across this reading, don't come to an early assumption that no, Krishna is anti-Darwinian. 
So not to read blurbs or not to read portions and parts and come to early assumptions on the person I'm trying to write biography for. That was the second thing I thought. And uh, I think I also made a third rule for myself, which is very different from any of my earlier writings. I, I consciously decided to romanticize my subject. Now, when a person you're writing about is himself so romantic about nature and the natural world, you have to kind of retain those portions of his romance with nature. And there's no way of doing it without romanticizing your own subject. So these were the three ethics I worked with. And uh, uh, I thought there was one major shift which took place in between. I initially wrote the piece as if I was writing it to conservationists or probably to wildlife historians. And I think the thing that I'm writing for school teachers wasn't very clearly laid out in my mind. But I really thank the reviewers for the initial reviews they gave me. And they helped me bring that focus back. And uh, one good thing about it was that uh, it brought me to a very conscious understanding of my teacher-student relationship with Krishnan. Uh, and so I, I have a sense of that teacher-student relationship with Krishnan thanks to this piece. Actually. So, that's, that's so what I'm that is interesting. So uh, in the first part of your answer, you, I think, mentioned about something, challenges. So did you face any challenges that you think are unique to this format? Uh, that was my biggest challenge, like I told you, sort of, that uh, when I began writing, I wrote for conservationists and wildlife historians. You know, I, I, I didn't really know how to write for school teachers and how teachers can use this material to, again, for their classroom pedagogies. So I, I, had, I didn't have that uh, the, the barometer or, or the optic to write in that way. But the reviewers really gave me some very careful questions and careful markers, and I kind of redrafted uh, in a way which is, which is more useful to school teachers. That was a challenge. Right. So in uh, your bio, you shared that uh, you find biographies of renowned and forgotten naturalists uh, deeply insightful. So could you share some examples of such insights? I think one of uh, one or two you have already mentioned, but yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Sort of, I didn't expect someone to read the bio and you know spring out a question from a small bio, but it's a very important and pertinent question. It actually defines everything which I try to do. Like I've told you, I've always been very interested in human animal relations in a historical perspective. And if you really want to understand human and animal relations, the whole continuum, the whole spectrum between humans and animals, you really can't ignore the naturalist because he seems to be sitting right in between. And uh, the naturalists of God knows how many centuries, from the 17th century onward, have not only studied animals, but they've also had to deal with human power structures. They've had to deal with foresters, they've had to deal with the bureaucracies, they've had to deal with local communities, politicians, policies, lawmakers. So just looking at the biography of a naturalist not only tells you something very valuable about an animal, it also tells you a lot about human society. And when it comes to a person like Krishna, it's like squarely pitched in between because he had this amazing uh, observational powers when it came to animals and he was also at odds with the government or with the public. So you, it really gives you an insight into the, into the very uh, complex relationship between humans and animals. Right, right. So, it is interesting that you choose to write a biography on a contemporary Indian naturalist and a nature writer. Now, why choose M. Krishnan as the uh, focus of this biography? Actually, that's a very important question you have asked, uh, sort of. There are actually three reasons why I thought uh, a naturalist like Krishnan is very important. Uh, most of Krishnan's formative writings, formative years, you can say stretched, you know, I mean, I would say the, the key periods where his writings really matters from, say, 1950 to 1970. Uh, during this very vital period, you find a number of naturalists condoned sport hunting. They condoned shikar. So even if you look at uh, Sali Mali, he felt that no, hunting animals is, is fine. That's the only way you can collect specimens and study them. And uh, other naturalists like, say, Edward Pritchard G., who was, who was based out of Northeast, he also very much like uh, Sali Mali believed that at least some hunting rights should be allocated to the royalty, to the erstwhile Rajas and Maharajas. It, it could be the Raja of Panna or it could be the Raja of Bharatpur. But in Kothwara, they should be allowed to kind of hunt occasionally under certain regulations. So uh, sportsmanship, shikar and natural history both went hand in hand to a large degree and extent. Now Krishnan is an exception. Krishnan is one person who never kind of uh, batted for such a policy. He was uh, strongly opposed to it. And for the fact that he was such a strong exception to the rule, I think he deserves a place in our textbooks. So he was far ahead of his times in that sense. Apart from that, I feel Krishnan is also very important for us because he was almost like a, a renegade. He was against, uh, he, he was at 
odds with the establishment, the political establishment, the policies of the time, the five-year plans. And he sometimes was also at odds with the general public and public citizenry. So when you read Krishna, this is the thing. You don't, you're not left with a rosy or very flowery image of the earlier governments or, or what the public thought in earlier times. You know. it, uh, Krishna helps you to come to a point of critical inquiry. He helps you to cultivate a critical spirit, which is again missing in a lot of our school textbooks. You know. And apart from that, the third factor I felt Krishna is truly important for us, uh, sort of, is that there's a terrible divide which is there in our uh, discourses nowadays. You, know, you find uh, there's a divide between people who work on animal rights and people who work on wildlife issues. These two things have got compartmentalized. So a person who's doing something for street dogs uh, will not do anything for the dole or the wild dog. It's rare that you find a person speaking, or even internationally, a person who's studying house lizards will, will not be studying uh, Komodo dragons. So there's this kind of divide which has come, you know. But in Krishna's case, you will not find this divide. You'll find that the concern for, say, a small frog in his balcony is matched by the concern he had for an elephant in the jungle. So I feel it completely abolishes very stereotypical ideas of what it takes to be a wildlife bird. And it teaches us very squarely that you no know, conservation begins from home. You don't need to wear a camouflage color dress and then go to a jungle, take a pair of binoculars and start studying nature. The concern for nature, the care for nature and the conservation of nature begins like just like charity. It begins at home, conservation also begins. So these are the three factors which I thought make Krishna very important for him, and uh, he really deserves a place in our text. Yeah, very interesting. So the how, how did you go about uh, collecting the facts of Krishna's life, and uh, once you have collected, how did you check their accuracy? Mm, that's also an interesting thing. Actually, uh, I must admit that I came upon Krishna by by rather by accident only when I was working on other historical material. So that is when I felt it was important for me to refer to a journal called uh, the Journal of Bombay Natural History Society. Uh, this is a journal which was started in 1886, and it is the journal of the BNHS, the Bombay Natural History Society, with which uh, Salim Ali, Edward Pritchard G, they were all associated. It was a landmark organization in that sense, civil society. Of, it still continues to exist. So uh, that's where I first came upon certain articles of it. I didn't use his articles for my historical academic work, but the articles per se were very interesting. They were extremely interesting. I went back to it again and again. And the course of going back to it again and again, I discovered there was this excellent compilation of his pieces put forward by Ramchandra Guha, the eminent environmental historian. And it was called Nature's Spokesman. It was a fantastic compilation. It was a fantastic introduction. That introduction is really worth reading. I think everyone should read it. And apart from that, I came upon a recent compilation, which is by uh, Shanti and uh, Ashish Chandola, which is also a reasonably good. Apart from that, a lot of this material has been fortunately digitized and it is available on mkrishnan.com. So these were different sources I kind of scouted for facts. And uh, I was also very fortunate that I managed to correspond with his, his granddaughter, Asha Hari Krishnan. And uh, she also gave me the rights to use the photo which is there. It's a rare photo of his because most often he took photos of wildlife, not of himself, like a selfie culture. <laughs> very different in those days. He, he, he took thousands of photos of wildlife and it was very rare to come across a photo of him. So I was very thankful to Asha Hari Krishna that she immediately responded to my mail and gave me the rights to use that photo. So this is how I kind of looked at facts. Now in terms of uh, checking for their accuracy, many of these pieces appear across different places. You know, The same piece will appear on mkrishnan.com. It is also there in the Ramchandra Guha's compilation, also in the book by Chandula. So I compared these pieces to ensure there is some kind of consistency, that the pieces are not very different from one another. If they are, then I had reason to suspect that perhaps I'm missing out on something. Or probably there's, there's something wrong with the, the pieces. There. But, I, but I didn't find any such discrepancies. That was one general uh, policy which I followed. Of course, there were certain errors which I made, which, which were again caught in the review process. I thank the reviewers for that. And there was some sloppy use of language which Asha Hari Krishna kind of indicated. So uh, I would say that uh, this is how we the process we followed. So what, what came out was the factual, uh, factual correctness of the piece owes to a lot of people other than me. But still, if there are some errors, there, 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 any errors which are left entirely mine. <laughs> no, no, so kind of you. So, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, once given this is a brief version of his life, mm -hmm. so what criteria did you use to decide which facts to retain? This is a smaller okay. article. And are there some facts that you consciously choose to leave out? 
uh, I, it actually goes back to the question you had asked earlier, Saurav, that why I chose to write on Krishna and that one was that he never hunted, never advocated for hunting. He didn't have any artificial divide between angle rights and wildlife. And uh, he, uh, he uh, had this difficult relationship with people around him. So I use these three parameters to see facts, select facts, identify facts and filter it out of his larger corpus. This was a conscious decision. There was nothing I consciously decided not to write about, but it was just that it got filtered and the rest just got left behind. Of course, there's valuable material. Otherwise, there are many, many ideas which you can explore out of Krishna's writing. So I use this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this threefold, uh, threefold uh, criteria to kind of filter out facts from his corpus. So that's why. Oh. Okay, okay. So, uh, could you share three key aspects of uh, Krishna's life? Uh, and writings that you think would be relevant to school children, uh, school science teachers in particular? This is a very valuable question and you know, I think this is one of the purposes of the whole piece and I hope so, some of the messages got across but asking this question helps me to clarify, you know, to drive home my point. In this sense, you know, I feel uh, sort of that, you know, one, one basic lesson for all school teachers out of reading Krishna is to be very kind to backbenchers. And to be very kind to people who are not very good in studies or don't have a good academic background. Krishna didn't have a great academic background. He went on to become one of the greatest naturalists of our times. So that is one lesson which I think if, if a student uh, appears to not be very competitive or doesn't want to run the rat race, then he may be having great capacities to become an environmentalist. So that is one lesson. Apart from that, the second most crucial lesson I feel sort of is that the interest, a student's interest in a given field need not begin from that field itself. So Krishna's initial interests were perhaps in literature, in arts, and that entire interest came from his father, Madhavaya, and also in things like you know, detective novels. And it is gradually that the interest begins to flow from literature, arts towards animals. And you find that continuum throughout his entire writing. Literature and art never gets left behind. In that sense, you know, I find Krishna very similar to, to our great writer, Honest Hemingway, who was very inspired by this uh, artist, the French artist, Paul Cézanne. And very frequently used to mention and say that he wanted his writings to appear like Sesani's paintings. So he wanted to write in a style which kind of resembled the Sesani's painting. So you find the inspiration can come from a sister discipline or a far off discipline and then gradually take a student in a different direction altogether. So we have to allow students to find their, their, their bandwidth and you know, to find their home grounds eventually. So just in case a student is very good in a certain subject, not to freeze them in that subject and say, oh, he'll make a good mechanical engineer. You never know from engineering, he may depart and probably become an environmentalist tomorrow. So to allow that kind of bandwidth. And the third thing uh, I feel is we have to learn from Krishna is that we should cultivate students which do not feel any compulsion to be agreeable to their educators. Now Krishna was a person who never, who was really, didn't care too much about being agreeable. You know, he wasn't the most amiable person. People formed opinions about him, but he really didn't. If he really disagreed, he disagreed. If he had a question, he'd ask it. So these are three factors which I feel, you know, sort of which Krishna's, uh, reading Krishna should inform every teacher that be kind to a backbencher, uh, interest in a given field need not begin from that field itself. And uh, if a student is disagreeable, you should feel happy about it. This interesting. So uh, as you mentioned, so good academic performance, uh, particularly science, is often considered essential for a career of uh, significance uh, as a naturalist or conservationist. In contrast, we see Krishna was by all accounts unexceptional at academic work uh, in school, in college. It is also evident that he was an avid student of the natural world, right? So. You suggest that to, uh, to Krishna, the natural world was not a mere object of study, but a subject of endless reverie and fascination. Could you elaborate on this difference? Why so, is it significant? This is a, a very nice question. Uh, you're right. No, Krishna didn't have any great academic background. He went to presidency college, I think, in 1927, didn't excel there. In the 1930s, I think he tried a career in law, nothing great came of it. And it was only in 1942, through some contacts and through some pressure, 
he managed to gain a job in the princely estate of Sandur, where he was partly a teacher, partly a magistrate, and also political secretary, secretary to the Raja of Sandur. But yeah, of course, you know, his interest in natural history followed him through and through, but no great academic background or career. Now, this is where it's interesting to understand his reverie and fascination for nature. Now, for people like me, or like someone who's got a typical PhD and excelled and is a gold medalist from a university, he's, uh, he's, he's trained to look at nature in a certain way. Like, he will formulate a hypothesis, he will evolve certain questions, he will take these questions to nature, and he will try to study some natural phenomena and then come to a, a generalizable theory or some conclusion in which he can be very proud and happy. Now, this formal process is practically absent in the case of Krishna. You will not find this hypothesis, objective, research, and conclusion theory coming. You will not find this kind of reasoning in his work. You will find a natural spontaneous entry into the world of nature. You will find a gradual immersion into the world of nature by observing small, small, small facts, sometimes in a seemingly random fashion. And out of this immersion, questions will emerge by themselves. Out of the immersion, not a prior, but out of immersion. Some questions will be answered. Some questions will not be answered. Some of the answers will pave way to fresh questions and that will lead to further immersion into nature. Now, this endless immersion which is taking place throughout his lifelong career is something which can only be a lifestyle choice or a lifelong romance. It cannot be a PhD objective or a crime. That is the reason I say that you know, Krishna's career is driven by fascination and reverie. It's not driven by uh, the thing of you know, logistically completing a study within five years and saying, hey, I got one book out or I got this out. and I got four academic articles and five this and five is on that. That is not his purpose. So uh, your article suggests that uh, Krishna's keen interest in the natural uh, natural world was uh, stopped by his uh, early experience with the countryside. Yeah. Uh, so could you touch upon these influences? And also uh, uh, the role they played in shaping his life and work. Sure. Krishnan was born in 1912 and uh, in Tirunel Valley. And in 1927, like I told you before, he joined Presidency College. But in between, uh, there was this key development, a very crucial shift which took place. His father shifted from uh, Chennai, Mysore to Mylopur. Uh, so Mylopur was uh, not, not the concretized uh, place it's become now. It's now become a rather concrete jungle. And uh, in those days, there was still a lot of greenery over there. And this is when, you know, Krishna used to venture out into the suburbs of Mylapur and see a lot of wildlife and a lot of wild animals. They could be mongooses, they could be palm civets, tortoises also, snakes, endless variety of birds and sometimes even the odd black buck. And all these species are, are written about sometimes from childhood. He taps into his childhood memory to write about them. So these initial experiences are like some repository he carries along with him at the same time. And oftentimes he turns back and taps into some childhood memory to explain how the landscape has changed, how transition has taken place. So this is how his early experience of the countryside actually kind of shaped him and gave, gave him some, some direction. In that. Right. So you also suggest that uh, his association with the botanist P.F. Faison uh, helped to develop his uh, interest in observing and recording interactions between plants and animals. And uh, can you t t could you tell us about a bit about uh, the about Faison and uh, what kind of work he did, what he was doing in India at that point of time? Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, actually, I have not ventured from fauna into flora very much in, in history. But uh, if you look at it, uh, Faison is a very important character. His full name was Philip Furley Faison. And he produced some of the first illust illustrated volumes on the flora of, of the Nilgiris and the Palni Hills. So it is it's, it's beautifully written and very well illustrated with some very beautiful illustrations, very ahead of its time. A very sincere, a very, very sincere botanist in that sense. And uh, I think his work came out roughly in 1915 or 1916. But uh, he was also attached to the British administration, as it was with many botanists, anthropologists, and ethnologists. And he joined, uh, he became the principal of Presidency College, I think, in 1925. So uh, this botanist becomes the principal in 1925. And in two years later, Krishnan enters Presidency College in 1927. And uh, I'm sure he was highly inspired and influenced by this man who was an authority in the subject and had produced very good crystalline writings of flora. And uh, that inspiration must have become a part of Krishna's life because 
in the future you find that krishnan again and again mentions the importance of planting indigenous varieties of trees along avenues or in groves which could be neem or it could be vakul or it could be bay he again and again insists on the planting of indigenous varieties as opposed to exotic varieties which could be like trumpet trees or gulmohar trees they may be beautiful in their own ways but uh, he was strongly opposed to the introduction of exotic species and always felt that you know, indigenous species should be promoted so this appears like some kind of a lasting influence which faisal had on krishna but the interesting part i find between the teacher student relationship is again very pertinent for teachers of today you find faisal in no way try to control krishna and try to make him a, a botanist you find after a period of time he goes from flora to fauna so there is a certain bandwidth which was allowed to krishna and he flowed from again it, now this leap is not as far from literature arts into uh, into animals but you still find that transition from floral aspects to faunal aspects without leaving flora behind he got a very keen sense of flora as well the second important thing of this relationship is you have to understand that many of these surveys which were conducted by people like faisal they were an exercise in colonial knowledge building they were uh, part of many surveys like geological surveys soil surveys so floral surveys and faunal surveys mammalia all these things they were a part of this whole colonial exercise of knowledge building now we should not reject it simply because it is colonial so you find that krishnan pays a lot of debt and he always pays homage and gives sufficient respect to many of these surveys and believes that they were an exercise in integrity they demonstrated scientific integrity they were expansive and they were rather intense in their own way i think this is one lesson which we can gain out of this relationship between faisal and krishnan that we can afford to learn from our adversaries without letting patriotism come in the way so this is a, a lesson i feel can be possibly gleaned out of krishnan so you write that uh, krishnan's relationship with the natural world had many shades it was eccentric passionate as well as empirical so can you elaborate on each of these three attributes with one or two examples sort of this will actually take me to a piece of his which was one of my favorite pieces like i told you i began by reading the jbnhs and some pieces of krishnan and jbnhs and it was uh, in the course of reading those pieces that i uh, became very interested in it so one of the initial pieces i came upon was was a, a piece written now uh, if i am correct it was i think it was published in the 75th volume of jbnhs the journal of bombay natural history society and it was written i think roughly in 1975 now this is a retrospective piece which will go back to 1947 and it will chart out a certain series of developments from 1947 to 1975 i think this one piece it's about a large banded centipede called scolopendra which i think really explains very nicely why he was eccentric and he was passionate and he was empirical at the same time so i think roughly somewhere close to the time when nehru was about to read out his uh, trist with destiny speech uh he, krishnan was sitting in the clubhouse of sandur the clubhouse of sandur where he used to work in the princely estate of sandur like i told you he was sitting in the clubhouse and playing a game of cards and uh, suddenly when he and his friends were playing uh, cards there was this large banded centipede which came out of a cricket mat so it was quite a big centipede you know, and everyone became very frantic and they got really worried and there was a lot of uproar and people got up from the table moved away and a lot of people felt that the centipede has to be killed instantly because it's it's a very lethal and deadly and a bite of the centipede can cause death so krishna intervened and told that well, this is completely erroneous and these are all wrong assumptions and when he was trying to pacify his friends one of his friends mr v s lard uh, told him you know krishna if you really feel that this fellow is not dangerous why don't you get bitten get yourself bitten and then prove it to us and he made a bet of 5 rupees i make a bet of 5 rupees that you get yourself bitten by the centipede and prove that it's harmless now what do you expect a person in normal circumstances to do to say okay no no let it be you know let's kill it off but what krishna does is he takes his sandals out and he gets himself bitten can you believe it to prove his point he takes his sandals out and gets himself thoroughly bitten and he is like he has to wriggle his toe with the centipede and it's written in a very humorous fashion and uh, after getting bitten of course nothing happens to him over the next 3 days and even the bit he explains it also in a very comical fashion which i'd like to read it out to you he says uh, mr lard did not pay the debt on that day mr lard lost the bet so he had to pay 5 rupees so on the next day when he saw krishna is fine he didn't pay the debt on that day as he prudently waited to see if any belated consequences would ensue who knows he may die on the second day or the third day but on the third day when the minor swelling had subsided of its own accord 
he paid up like a gentleman so so this is you know a example of you know how he could be very eccentric and very different from many people but that is not the end of it he uh, again sees the centipede in the 1960s along with the sun on a tree and he sees a bird uh, swooping down and eating the centipede the same type of centipede you know and he is very pleasantly happy to see nothing happens to the bird the bird does not die of any kind of poisoning and uh, finally coming very close to the time when he was writing in 1975 he reports an instance when his housemate came running to him and told him there's a similar centipede in the kitchen behind a bamboo basket so what do we do about it so krishnan once again goes up and uh, he you know tries to examine the centipede it's the same type of centipede so just see the observation he says i seized the middle section of the centipede with a pair of long nosed pliers and lifted the centipede to my surprise the entire basket came up and i had to hold the basket down to extract the centipede with the other hand so powerful was the grip of its legs you see the fascination he has got for the small centipede the grip of its legs i don't know how many people write in this vein nowadays you know but that's not the end of it eventually the centipede gets injured and he feels very bad for it and he finally decides it's best to kill it and pull it out of its pain so when he takes a sandal and slaps it to death he notices there's no phosphorescent glow there is no phosphorescent glow like other reddish centipedes report when they come under someone's foot and this is another question which is left there in the back of his mind it's an empirical question it's a highly empirical question so it's i think in this one piece when he's speaking about the centipede you get to see an initial eccentricity in which he is willing to get himself bitten you see an endless fascination when he talks about how the he talks about the grip of the centipede's legs and towards the end when he he puts the centipede out of pain by killing it he observes that it does not have the same phosphorescent glow that you find in many of the other smaller reddish centipedes when they accidentally come under someone else's foot and this is a very empirical mind which is at play and uh, for me this is one piece in which captures the different moods of krishna you get to see his eccentricity his passion and his empiricism at the same time so so that is uh, what, what i had to had in mind actually this is so uh, crisp yet so detailed so this is a fascinating writer really yes so in the title of your article you refer to krishnan as a chronicler of the natural world hmm. and uh, the dictionary meaning of the chronicler is a person who records historical events as they happen so why did you use this term for krishnan i think a similar example you gave earlier yes so it is very like i think you caught it you know sort of it's it goes back to the large banded centipede you find he writes so very often he writes in a very retrospective way we can take you back to 1947 bring you to the 1960s 70s observations and then bring you very close to the present from where he is writing it's this uh, retrospection which goes back into the past mapping out animals across a certain continent a certain timeline which actually makes him a chronicler of historical events and he not only does it for centipedes he can also do it for a landscape and like i told you he also taps into his childhood memories very often you know to show how landscapes have changed so in all uh, senses you find that he is he is very keenly attentive to historicity he is very keenly alive to the historical dimension of what nature is undergoing and you can see the transition of nature the the denudation of nature very clearly in his writing so uh, conservation biology uh, uh, biodiversity uh, as well as interaction between uh, plants and animals are included as uh, topics in school science and specifically in biology how would you describe krishnan's records of the natural world as a uh, writings on natural history why so and how is natural history different from biology as we study in this school uh, at the school level uh, actually sort of you asked a very uh, massive question and it's a very debated question also where natural history ends and where conservation science begins but uh, i'll just give you a very brief brief kind of explanation which i think may be helpful for for the audience or for teachers also it is true that natural history does not feature very clearly in textbooks 
the history of natural history as to how it evolved as a science or a discipline, very often I feel does not come across through much of the reading material or literature we have for children. But despite that, you find that natural history is actually a very old discipline. You know? It goes back by millenniums. And I think one of the earliest naturalists is considered to be Pliny the Elder. And he was one of the first persons who made an effort to identify different species and to even classify and categorize different species. It was a very rudimentary effort which he made in the beginning of the first millennium, which may have been 20 CE or probably 30 CE, you know. And uh, it is only towards, I think, say 16th century or 17th century, you find people like John Ray trying to make the whole discipline of natural history more formal and giving it a certain shape. By roughly 17th, 18th century, you've got a taxonomic classification which comes up, which is, you know, this bit to kind of classify animals according to a certain hierarchy. So you have order, family, genus, species, like the typical hierarchy which we've got class, order, family, genus, and species. And uh, this was popularized largely by Carl Linnaeus. And it was roughly at the same time that the binomial nomenclature also came up. So that you, when you name a certain species, like for example, a species is named as Panthera tigris, then Panthera refers to the genus and tigris to the species. So this was a certain formalization of the entire discipline which took place in 17th and 18th century. And it was roughly at the same time that naturalists began to venture out of Europe and went to different parts of the globe and began to identify, categorize, classify, and even collect specimens to broaden and enhance their understanding of the natural world. In the process of doing this whole thing, they also observed natural phenomena very closely. It was not simply identifying and classifying, but also seeing the traits of animals, also observing the differences in animals from one location to the other, and also looking at their behaviors and with great clarity and specificity. So naturalists, I think, over centuries have built a colossal corpus of information and understanding about nature. In contrast, I feel that Krishna's work is steeped in this tradition. It is very clear that he is very interested in identifying, classifying, and observing behavior of animals with great, with great, uh, with great uh, precision. It is uh, completely so. When you compare this with, say, something like conservation science or biodiversity or you know conservation biology, you find that conservation science is relatively new. It is not more than, say, I think, about half a century old. And the difference between conservation science and natural history. Now, this is something which is debated extensively, but in my understanding, and to keep things simple. The difference is that conservation science is more interested in the laws of nature, not simply identifying and classifying and categorizing, but looking at a certain law or a pattern in nature or the theory of nature. Now, they could be theories relating to population dynamics. They could be theories relating to the inheritance of traits, why animals, how animals inherit certain traits as opposed to the other. They could be theories with relation to speciation, how species are born. Theories with relation to extinction, how species vanish. Theories in relation to biodiversity, which is the relationship between different organisms. And these different theories are kind of understood and evolved at different scales. So they could be a micro scale or a macro scale. A micro scale may look at a small ecosystem spread over a couple of hills. And a macro scale could be a landscape which is spread between, say, two countries or two continents. So they look at it at a micro level and a macro level. So this is largely what you know, conservation science has to offer. And conservation science makes uh, extensive use of statistics, gene science, laboratory experiments, and uh, also cutting edge technologies in the form of camera traps and GIS and GPS technologies, satellite imagery. Now you find Krishnan does not use any of all this. He didn't have all this, he didn't, it wasn't at his disposal. And uh, if further down, let's hope we have the opportunity to see why Krishnan was also slightly skeptical on the use of statistical columns. He felt by turning animals into small numbers, will we really know what they feel? Will we really know what their emotions are? Can we cultivate empathy to, towards animals through statistics? So these are some of the apprehensions he had towards conservation science. But nonetheless, Krishnan asked a lot of important questions as a naturalist. He always asked questions as in, how do how does a certain species survive? Or how does a certain species adapt to a certain climate? Why do certain species eat this kind of food and not that kind of food? Why do they forage in a certain location and not in a different location? And all these questions have been of great relevance to conservation scientists in recent times. So I would like to picture Krishnan as a, as a naturalist who was steeped in a far older tradition of identifying, classifying, observing traits, and uh, with certain apprehensions for conservation science. But he also stood at the dawning of conservation science. And he asked important questions which were of, continue to be of relevance for conservation science. So uh, this is largely my you know, very simple way of distinguishing natural history from conservation sciences and why I, I would like to say that it's best to call Krishnana a naturalist. To call him a conservationist would be anachronistic. 
it would be to you know interpret him in terms of the present <laughs> which is which is slightly historically erroneous right right no this is quite interesting uh, and comprehensive uh, so you highlight some aspects of krishna's writings that set him apart from other writers and uh, naturalists of that time one of these is the fact that krishnan chose to focus on the landscape and wildlife wildlife of uh, peninsular india and uh, why was this unusual at the time uh, would it be unusual even today uh not really unusual uh, sort of it is uh, he basically felt that a lot of the other geographies were being studied by other naturalists so rajasthan was being attended to by by salim ali and who was uh, doing extensive studies in bharatpur say support bharatpur and edward pritchard ji was doing extensive studies in say in parts of of, of uh, northeast and uh, there, were, there were people looking at central india also northern india also you had uh, old time uh, colonial administrators some of them who stayed back in india like rc morris who were looking at certain aspects of kashmir the dachigam sanctuary so there were different people it's not like there was an absence of naturalists during his time so he preferred to concentrate on a geography which was closer to home where he'd be able to probably intervene over a longer period of time so it's just not like you do a study and come back home and you can't intervene and can't do anything about that I think he chose a locale or chose a geography in which he could continue to be a voice and continue to bring about change. So I think it's his uh, his impetus for activism, a certain certain sort of environment, <clears throat> which made him concentrate uh, in peninsular India. And uh, it's not unusual for people to kind of remain focused on a certain geography. It's like in uh, contemporary times, I think studies have become very regional also. A person may study a small water body or just a small stream or a, or a rivulet. And there could be a rather intense study on a small, small, small land mass. Right. And a second feature is that he had evolved uh, his own methods of study. Yeah. Very so, uh, and you also gave some glimpses also. So could you highlight two, three aspects of this methods? Um, this method, and how does this uh, compare with the methods the naturalists use today, today's time? So. I really uh, wouldn't say that you know his methods were. I don't know because I don't know if they're extremely unique to him, but they surely are interesting in a sense, you know. And there are methods which speak more of a certain sort of craft, and uh, it goes down to very small things as well, you know. For example, in a certain place, I think in an article of his which appeared uh, in, in the Statesman, the Country Notebook column, which he maintained, he says, uh, "Over the years, I've acquired the ability to stay still and to move." if i must say in slow motion so you find you know almost gives you an image of a man who's doing tai chi in the jungle you know, like moving really slowly and uh, just blending into the entire landscape which is uh, which is which i find fascinating as to how he moved in practically in slow motion and you can feel the slow motion in his writing as well it translates you know you don't find his, his writings never skip they don't jump a beat they don't he doesn't write in haste ever it's like you're watching something in slow motion it's a delight of watching something in slow motion and uh, he also kind of did small things like you know, devising a special kind of attire for himself now this is also very interesting i mean the kind of details you would go into so he decided to buy a khaki hat and he wore khaki colors to blend into the landscape and he also decided to make a wheel for himself which he put around the hat so that the animals cannot recognize him as a human and of course with places for his eyes but then he gave that up and he went and he, he, he kind of improvised on it and he opted for strips of cloth which were knotted at regular intervals and uh, so that those knots could uh, make it possible for you to suspend uh, su su suspend uh, twigs and a little bit of grass so it would give more for a feel of camouflage you know so he had this wheel which almost looked like foliage and uh, he would do these kind of things to just kind of blend into the landscape and uh, of course you know, if you really look at some of his methods uh, he used he was a very keen photographer no i'm not not very really, uh, keenly attuned into photography myself but i know he used a pentacon 6 which he procured with great difficulty and he always preferred black and white photography and uh, to a large degree he preferred to use uh, roll films which uh, made it possible for him to develop larger prints you know and uh, he was he was quite a quite a uh, phenomenal photographer in that sense you know so uh, these are some of the some of the things which he did but uh, largely i feel in terms of method it's the gaze which he brought to the animals 
it's that sensitive gaze and that gaze of curiosity you know, which you brought which which is unparalleled you may have other naturalists also who may kind of may kind of devise a certain dress or you know move very slowly through the world. but i think cultivating the same gaze as krishna is it's, it's quite a task and very difficult it won't come easily and naturally and even things like you know he would be very careful about how the wind was blowing because he knew the wind will carry his, his his smell to an animal so he would even account for the wind in a jungle when he's moving through it so that animals don't get to know of his presence right so you also mentioned that a third feature that you highlight is his style of writing oh, yes. so could you highlight two three aspects of this style and has it had any influence on nature writing today uh i'm sure if people read him closely for his style i have feeling people have read him for his probably his scientific input but uh, to read krishna simply as a writer to read krishna simply as a person who had a flair for language i don't know how many people have done that and that was my beginning point of interest in this person in loads of literature which may be very boring to read you find this one naturalist who just simply grips your attention so i got certain excerpts of his writings which i'd like to read out to you and some of my favorite paragraphs of his uh, writings it gives you a sense of how he wrote the style the passion with which he wrote as well so this is one of his pieces which is available in uh, nature spokesman it's, it's there in ramchand who has edited a volume nature spokesman uh i'll just read he says there was an ineffable assurance of peace in that sylvan retreat the morning sun filtered by the green canopy high overhead illumined the scene with a soft and clear effulgence the young grass underfoot cushioned each footfall like a carpet and was innocent of guile the still vistas flanked by the great gnarled boles seemed inviolable in their ancient calm and somewhere at hand an ayora was calling flutely to its mate but that sixth sense that we who wander through the jungles learn to know and trust warned me just in time suddenly i felt a prickling sensation along the nape of my neck as a feeling of imminent danger overwhelmed me i looked up hastily and saw that a python was waiting a python was lying in wait you just notice the vivid description the graphic description of the landscape a sense of how slowly he is moving through the entire forest which has been captured in words and also the whole thing of sensations the prickling prickling sensation on the nape of his neck there so many feelings and there's such slowness of motion and there's so much of detail in this one paragraph that really amazes me and uh, you find that it's not lacking in facts and you find that he writes in first person so a lot of naturalists and scientific literature is written in a very objective fashion a person may write the researcher saw an animal across the but he doesn't hesitate to use the i i saw and he brings himself into his writings he's an acknowledged participant in his own writings so he makes room for himself in his writings you can see krishna the naturalist in his own writings which is very rare actually you know so otherwise the writer is always like this invisible ghost you know somewhere behind in the writing somewhere else. you won't find that distance between the author and his writing in krishna i'll give you another sample of his writing you know he is describing swifts he says in the hand these swifts felt very unlike what one might suppose they would feel like they were of course astonishingly light but they seemed to be made up of iron hard muscle and fluffy down with hardly any soft flesh except at the white gullet Now, when he gives this description of the swift, it literally feels like you're holding the swift in your own hands. So, you know, the the power of Krishna's writing and style of writing is how transportive it can be. So, uh, uh, this is really, I think, it's really kind of uh, fascinating, which is which is what I like. And uh, uh, of course, he was also a prolific writer, and uh, he he wrote uh, in the country. He wrote or uh, maintained a column in the Statesman called the Country Notebook. For nearly 46 years, and he contributed rigorously, religiously, 46 years. So this is uh, some things I had to say about the style of his writing. Right. So one of our uh, viewers, uh, Karnika, she says uh, she actually sends thank you to Varun for uh, your insightful sharing. She's also saying that uh, what I am hearing is that M. Krishnan's writings in the context of education of children, adults. to de facilitate uh, the current engagements in citizen science and uh, she also says that in fact uh, he is being nurturing the sense of wonder and art also uh, reminds me of uh, rudolf steiner so it is uh, it is true you know i mean the, the disappearance of this gap between the self and the other 
you know, where you actually don't have, you find a certain merging which takes place, which is what Steiner also talks about. I mean, Steiner was, of course, a philosopher par excellence and has contributed more and more avidly to the discipline of education. But this disappearance of, of uh, the gap between self and others is something which you feel again and again in, in Krishna's writings. And uh, yeah, even I think even Indian uh, psychology of uh, at that time, in the, in the mid early 90s, actually we were rediscovering our Indian psyche also. That is our connectedness of uh, nature and uh, self. So a fourth feature is uh, related to the subjects of his study. And I quote you, even today, it would be hard to find an environmentalist who writes as passionately about both wild animals and their urban counterparts as Krishna did. So could you give us one or two examples? And again, uh, has this approach had any influence on nature writing or conservation today? I think this one uh, potential of Krishna's writings has been completely lost in our time. But uh, of course, no, like I can give plenty of examples. He spoke very passionately about donkeys as beasts of burden. He spoke uh, very, uh, very passionately about his pet goat, who was a very, uh, very uh, named Walchand or Wally. He spoke about his uh, street dogs, the dogs in the street, and made a case for them. He felt that they shouldn't be exterminated. They should be removed from the streets in any which way. There was also this program of exterminating crows, which was planned in the 1960s. He, he objected against it. And he felt there could be better ways of beautifying the city than killing crows. So in every way, you find that he was contributing to the literature and the understanding of uh, what we call urban ecology right now. It's become a big word now, but we're somewhere getting close to it. But uh, the way he shifts from urban to rural, rural to urban, and wilderness to urban is, is something which I really don't find in too many writings. So, uh, so I have this one paragraph of his which kind of really shows how closely he used to observe urban life, and there would be real relevance for urban ecologists as well. And uh, I feel it's one of my, one of my favorite paragraphs, and I'm tempted to read out of it. Uh, so he's talking, and it's really kind of, it's really very enduring paragraph. It just, just uh, makes your heart go out to this man. You know? it makes you wonder who he is. You know? just, so he says, uh, the piece is called Incessant Rain. I've been spending my time between wiping and drying my possessions and wandering through the rain looking for lesser light. So it's raining, it's rainy season, and he's wiping and drying his possessions most of the time. He's also wandering around through the rain looking for lesser light, which is in the city. Where are the squirrels that were loudly in evidence last week? Where are the crows and the sparrows and the other familiar birds? He's concerned that, you know, what, is the, what the rain must have done to squirrels and to, to, uh, to crows and sparrows, you know. I mean, how many people, when it begins to rain, would worry about where the, the sparrows and crows are in their city? And then he goes on to describing, though the crows and sparrows are not there, at least the frogs are audible. Then he comes to the best part, you know. He says, in a mosque, I have passed many times these last four days, the pigeons sit still and huddled within the sharply arced, sheltering niches in which they nest. From a tea shop across the road, I have watched these birds for nearly an hour through the grey, streaky fall of rain, and they have hardly moved except to shift their static weight from one leg to the other. In this rain, Krishna is standing in a small tea stall for hours, observing the birds in the niches of mosques. And they, the kind of fascination, I mean, just, just, just makes my heart go out to him. Right? So who, who does this? Like, you know, in a rainy weather, you just, you're so concerned about the birds of your city. You go and stand in a small tea stall, and I'm sure he had tons of coffee and smoked loads of cigarettes. And just observing, uh, he, he used to smoke quite a bit. And just observing birds in, in, the, in the niches of a mosque. And that's not the end of it. So someone should really read this piece, because then he connects the observations he makes with the pigeons with a certain couplet which is there in Sangam literature, in Tamil poetry. And he refers to a certain poem which provides a similar description of pigeons, which is called Nedunar Vadai. So it's, it's a classic poem, a very old poem, which is nearly two millenniums old. He's connecting. Now, this is where you get to see the connection between ecology, literature, and arts. He's observing phenomena. He's concerned about urban life, while urban animals and urban context. And he connects it to Tamil poems, which, which go back many millenniums. So uh, it, it's, it, I think it speaks a lot about Krishna. And I think... This is one of my favorite pieces by him. A short piece is called Incessant Rain. People should read it. Certainly, we, we should read it. Yeah, and you suggest that one of the most distinctive features of his writings in his spirit of inquiry 
And uh, this is most evident in the fact that he would rake up several interesting questions without sharing answers uh, to all of them. So uh, could you elaborate on, on this approach with one or two examples? Surely, surely, sir. So like I told you about the, the thing about the large bandwidth center, one was one. then there are many such pieces of this which you'll find again in scattered places. You'll find where he contemplates, you know, when he was in Sandur, why the rosy pastor, a very cute bird, settles down in certain locations to eat on certain types of food and not in other locations. So he is completely puzzled as to why the pastor should settle down, the rosy pastor should settle down in places where there's relatively less green green and less chances of finding food over there, as opposed to a place which is more green or got uh, ripening fruits and crops. You know. So this is again a question which he leaves. He, he, he doesn't answer the question. You will find something very similar happening when he looks at certain birds like a cuckoo eating uh, the flower of a yellow oleander, which can be poisonous for certain other animals, but it's, you know, it's not poisonous for the cuckoo. He's puzzled. How come it's not, it's not poisonous for one animal but poisonous for another? So these are questions which may have been answered, may not have been answered by conservationists now. But the nature of his writing is that he ends with a question. He leaves it open-ended. He doesn't want to conclude. He doesn't want to say that, yes, I know I have the answer to this. And there's one very crucial lesson which I think all nature writers have to learn out of this. Or even for any teachers who are writing on nature. It is a very crucial lesson. That you don't have to always wait to have all the answers in your life to begin writing. We needn't have to wait to that point till we know everything, then only to begin to write because it speaks of a certain banking concept of education which Paulo Freire used to speak about, where the teacher is supposed to have all the answers and the student is supposed to be a passive recipient. I know everything, I will tell it to you and you're supposed to absorb whatever I tell you. Rather than Krishna, you'll find that it's open-ended, he's got a question in the mind, he's on the quest for answers and he wants his readers to join that quest. So it is a and it is an encouragement to readers to join the quest which he is on, which I feel is far more invigorating for any form of pedagogy. So uh, I think we should speak about our questions and to articulate our questions even more carefully and nicely and not necessarily feel compelled to provide an immediate answer. In this one sense, I think Krishnan's teachings are very similar to Jiddu, Jiddu Krishnamurti is also. And uh, Jiddu used to say something which I really believe in. Uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti used to say that freedom from Freedom from the desire for an answer is essential for an understanding of the problem. Freedom from the desire for an immediate answer is crucial and important for an understanding of the problem, he said. You find the same spirit in uh, Krishna's writings as well. That, you know, the freedom from the desire for an immediate answer and providing an answer really paves the way to a very keen and good understanding of the problem. Now, unless you don't come to a keen and good understanding of the problem, all your answers are going to be partial and fragmentary. So, so this is, uh, it actually speaks of his rigor in that sense. And in the process, he ends up culturing your curiosity as well. And he cautions people uh, not to come to premature conclusions. Right. Right. So, as you mentioned that uh, he tries to answer with the, he finds answer alone with the readers. So while leaving readers with suspense might be very effective strategy to build curiosity, right? So how did Krishnan's quench his own curiosity? Did he ever try to find answers to these questions himself or with the help of scientists, experts? Uh, of course, you know, I mean, Krishnan, of course, did touch base with some other naturalists, though he was not always on favorable grounds or or favorable terms with these other naturalists. I think his way of quenching his curiosity was to treat nature as his educator, was to go back to nature more and more. So he could turn to his peers. I'm sure he did, and there were a fair number of occasions that he may have also. But his primary source of education was nature itself. So if he had questions, then it's, it's just more encouragement to go back to nature and to look at nature more closely and let nature kind of reveal itself to you. So, uh, so I think that is one thing which he did. And uh, that's the reason you find that uh, uh, even if he didn't take the help of his peers, uh, he was a very, uh, very, very uh, critical reviewer of, his, of the works of his fellow scientists. So they could be fellow naturalists who are producing literature and material. And he was very quick to identify the deficiencies in their work. And I think one of the reasons he was so good in pointing out deficiencies was because he actually treated nature as his educator. I can give you an example 
example of how we showed deficiencies, uh, uh, deficiencies in uh, fellow naturalists' work. In the 1980s, uh, the senior forester, he was the first director of project type, Kailash Sankala. And uh, Kailash Sankala put out a book called Tiger, the story of the Indian tiger. It was avidly, it was avidly read during its times, and still people do refer to Shankala's work. But there's a short review which Krishnan wrote of Shankala's work, and uh, he was able to show the number of errors which were there in the work. And it's really amazing. I mean, the kind of eye he had, and how he could catch certain details, and he could point out that this is factually not correct and that is not factually correct. For example, he says uh, the slender loris, far from being a creature of the evergreen forests of Western Ghats, is much commoner in mixed and even the dry deciduous forests in eastern and central South India. This is one error which he points out in Sankala's work. He goes on and he looks at the photographs. He says, the bird in plate number 105 is a lesser white scavenger vulture and not a king vulture. So he, he points out small, small errors in this. And I'm pretty sure if uh, Krishnan picked up anyone's book to review, the author would have much to fear because he was a very critical reviewer. He would really kind of find the smallest of errors. Right. So, so uh, how have the questions Krishnan raised shaped ecology and conservation? And uh, have other researchers attempted to find answers to these questions? Actually, sort of, I really, I, I'm not aware of any, they could be, I may not be aware because my understanding is also limited. I probably read uh, Krishnan in a very narrow way. I'm not aware of any, any fellow scientist or conservationist or naturalist who uses a question raised by Krishnan as a starting point of his inquiry. I've not come across someone saying that, oh, Krishnan asked this question, now I'll begin my inquiry on that line. I've not come across any such study. But of course, there are a number of uh, conservationists, ecologists who have been inspired by his work. So for example, if you look at Raman Sukumar's work uh, on elephants, fantastic piece of work. It's a lifelong work, you know. His uh, book, Elephant Days and Nights, which was published in 1994, very rightly identifies that Krishnan was one of the first persons to identify that there is some sort of infrasound communication between elephants. He identified this infrasound communication between elephants, say, roughly in 1972, but he didn't have the gadgets, he didn't have the equipment to prove it. And this thing was proven very much later by a lady called Kathleen Payne in 1984 using the necessary equipment in the Washington Park Zoo. So it was almost 12 years earlier that Krishnan had already kind of put this thesis forward. You also have famous tiger conservationists like Ullas Karans who are supposed to have been inspired by M. Krishnan. And Krishnan also made a very strong case for the wild dog, the dhol. In the 1970s, the dhol was still treated like vermin. From this list of uh, list of uh, vermin which was you know, created in the colonial period, even leopards and tigers were treated as vermin during the colonial period. The eminent uh, wildlife historian uh, Mahesh Rangarajan has written extensively about this but it changed after independence. But even in 1970s, which is quite a few years after independence, animals like the wild dog were still treated like vermin. And Krishnan completely worked against this notion that it's vermin. And he wrote, with the tiger and panther on the decline, dhol are of special importance in maintaining the balance of nature, as herbivores would overrun the jungles without them. So he felt they also have a role to play, considering that tiger and panthers are in reduced numbers, it is up to the dhol to kind of maintain the balance between predators and prey. But uh, so they shouldn't be considered vermin at all. Now, this becomes a kind of starting point, and this is something which uh, AJT John Singh's uh, work on dhol, his uh, seminal, uh, seminal thesis on the dhol from the Bandipur hills, the Bandipur region. He, it was a PhD thesis, and a fantastic work. It builds around this kind of observations made by Krishna, and of course takes it forward. So I would say people like Ullas Karan and AJT John Singh and, uh, and even uh, Raman Sukumar have all, all drawn out of Krishna's or been inspired by Krishna in some way or the other. Okay. Okay. So one of the most interesting features that you speak about is Krishna's interest in the emotional states <clears throat> of the animals he observed and wrote about. So, could you touch upon these and share one, two examples of such observations? Of mm, the emotional states thing has got a certain context, uh, you know, of, uh, sort of. And uh, I really do not know the precise moment or the precise, it would be only very tentative for me to say where his interest in the emotions began. There could be multiple reasons, it could be personal or it could be professional. 
while this confined myself to some of the probable professional reasons why he became interested in emotions. Now, he was writing this article on emotive kinships, as it was called, or emotions of animals, I think roughly in 1978, which is you know, the late 1970s, where uh, quote unquote old school natural history was going into back, and you had conservation sciences which were coming up. It was the dawning of conservation sciences. And Krishnan was noticing that, no, of course, conservation scientists are using evolutionary theories, they're using gene science and using a lot of statistical columns to come to their understanding of nature. And uh, he felt that this was a highly mechanistic way of kind of looking at nature. He does not dispute it. He says that there could be many benefits of you know, using these new methods in studying and understanding nature. They are valid in their own way. But he felt at the same time that it's becoming very mechanistic. And one of the fallouts of this highly mechanistic way of looking at nature was to actually look at animals also as machines, was to make animals also very predictable. So it basically began to reduce animals to, the description of animals reduced was reduced to a bundle, like he says, a bundle of uh, a mass of conditioned reflexes and instinctive responses. So it is, you know, an animal is nothing more than conditioned reflexes and instinctive responses. And he personally felt that this is uh, going the wrong way. And the animals could be having a certain emotional, inner emotional world of their own, which is beyond conditioned reflexes and instinctive responses. So this is where he starts becoming more and more interested in the, in the emotional world of animals. And he tries to take the discussion back into natural history and show that you know, naturalists have studied outer behaviors. They may have not used gene science, but by looking at the outer behavior of an animal, you can come to a certain understanding of what are the emotions and these emotions are distinct and different from purely physical or physiological states. They could be in the nature of mood or feelings or emotions. And he points this out not only with the pet animals around him, he points it out with, uh, with elephants who flap their ears in certain places at certain locations. And he provides evidence to show that the flapping of their ears and, and the twirling of their tails could be, uh, could be symptomatic of, of a certain form of exuberance. A certain type of happiness. So elephants only flap their ears when they're generally happy or they want to play and they're in high spirits. And he provides similar kind of examples when it comes to birds. And he asks a pertinent question which he doesn't answer again. He says, why do birds sing? Is it because of love? Is it because of territory alone? Or is it because of the joy of singing itself? So, you know, this is a very valuable question which I think is not lost in statistical columns and evolutionary theory. You know? So uh, there are people who again, you know, again looking at emotions of animals, you know, there, there's a certain study which is going into it. But they seem to have forgotten that perhaps Krishna was one of the first persons who, who was one of the early persons who began to speak about the emotional states of animals. <coughs> right. So I think this leads to the second question. In, uh, in what ways uh, the process or conditions mm -hmm. uh, needed to make such observations different from uh, so oh, okay so one thing is so yes yes you you mentioned one more term there is emotive kinships yes so yes. so what does it mean yes so again it, this is basically the same article of 1978 which is titled emotive kinships you know where he tries to show that uh, he got faith in conservation science but his apprehensions as well and uh, emotive kinships, uh, the general notion he was trying to feel at that point in time is that emotions are not a purely human experience. Emotions can be experienced by animals as well. And uh, they can be expressed in many different ways to build solidarity between the members of a given species. So kinship is basically solidarity between members of a certain, like anthropologists use it in a very different way, referring to how people of a certain family cooperate and work together or live with one another or members of a certain caste or certain community or tribe kind of work. So he brings this anthropological conceptual framework into, into the field of natural history. And he uses emotive kinships. Emotions are expressed in a certain way to build solidarity between the, the members of a given animal species. So this is uh, his concept of emotive kinship. I can provide you an example of uh, the Jekyll. And uh, he it's his example, it's not my example. He says, so long, long as we do not presume that jackals hear the call of their kind exactly as, as we do. So long as we do not presume that jackals hear the call of their kind exactly as we do, we are on sound ground in assuming the purpose of the chorus is mainly a social location announcement and sometimes an assembly call. So when jackals cry somewhat in the form of chorus, 
he says is basically one jackal trying to tell the other that this is where I am and this is where you are, and they get a sense of where each of these jackals is located in the family. They could have spread out, but now they know where each one is located, and it's a form of assurance. Each jackal knows where the other member of his community is at a certain point in the night, and it could sometimes also be an assembly call where jackals are actually informing one another to aggregate to a certain place. So, so this is this speaks very squarely about this kind of intra-species communication which is taking place between the jackals, a certain sense of cohesion, a desire for cohesion, and a feeling of solidarity. Let's come together. So it's an example of emotive kinships. I would say that it's unfortunate that even Krishna dropped this whole line of inquiry beyond a point. But it's a very valuable line of inquiry. And I don't know why he dropped it. If it was because there was some criticism or people kind of said that he's not, he's not being scientific enough. Okay. So I think that's why the next questions actually. So I was actually starting with that, that uh, in what ways was the processor conditions needed to make such observations different from statistical studies? Yeah, so this is almost like it goes back to old school natural history. Right. Where you immerse yourself in nature and you observe nature very closely without kind of making your presence felt. It's almost like you have to be a present absence. And uh, it's just old school natural history which he was relying on. And of course, a certain mm -hmm. high level of sensitivity. And uh, right. not being blocked to the notion that you know, emotions are something which is, uh, which is uh, if emotions are not instantly caught in a chart, it doesn't mean mm -hmm. that they're consistent. The other thing you have to also recognize sort of that, uh, you know, when he was saying this, he was also drawing from some of the existing literature from the West. And he does in certain instances quote uh, two gentlemen, I'm not aware of their work. They're called Nico Tinbergen and Conrad Lawrence. And uh, they had done some studies on the emotions of animals in the 1960s. You know. And uh, they proved that you know, birds are highly emotional and complex beings. And the interesting thing is he was quoting out of the works of these two authorities who later went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physiology in 1993. So I think you can say that Krishnan was early to identify the value of such research much before it won the Nobel Prize also. Right, right. So this is also the way you look at the world. I think it is more about how you connect. True, true. It's so, a primitive perception also. Right, right. So uh, I think it is there in your answer still uh, for to know more specifically. So have these aspects of Krishnan's work had any influence on the focus and process that uh, naturalists or conservationists uh, used to study animals uh, today, present time. So this is like, I'll just stick to the emotional component. Now, of course, you know, there's a lot of inquiry which has gone into the emotions of animals. We've got Mark Beckhoff's work on the emotional lives of animals. And people are very familiar with Peter Wallabine's work. And I think almost everyone reads it or uses it like a starting point to understand plants and animals. So in the inner life of animals, even Peter Wolvin acknowledges that animals have got memories and they can feel pain and trauma and suffering. And just not internationally, but even within India, like if you look at uh, the National Institute of Advanced Studies, which is based out of Bangalore, there's an entire department which is uh, devoted to the study of uh, animal behavior and cognition. And these people are also looking at you know, different aspects of emotions. It's been given a more, uh, a more, uh, more uh, up-to-date uh, terminology in the form of uh, Affective ecologies, we call it affective ecologies, right? Now they use such framework. Affective, uh, affective is a term which sociologists used to use previously to understand moods, feelings, attitudes, and emotions in human society. The affective now, dimensions. Yeah, affective dimensions. So, so now affective ecology is to understand, say, the relationship between a local tribe and a macaque, or say, uh, between a mahawat and his elephant. You know? So, uh, broadening the concept of affective dimensions to also include the non-human world. But uh, right. Much of this literature is there and it's kind of building and developing. It's just been forgotten that perhaps uh, Krishnan was one of the first persons to have actually instigated a, or, you know, kind of initiated a thought in this direction. It would be worth, worth revisiting Krishnan simply for his concept of emotive kinships and uh, looking at it very carefully across his entire writing and building an academic article. Right. So you also mentioned that Krishna's interest in the emotional states of the animals uh, that he studied often left him uh, open to the dangers of anthropomorphism. So, so for those who are unfamiliar with it, so with the term. 
<clears throat> so could you tell us what anthropomorphism means? This is a, you know, I mean, I, I must acknowledge, I should have been more careful in writing that sentence, but it's a very valid question. Uh, the question you ask, uh, you know, anthropomorphism is, is basically the tendency to see animals uh, in our own light, to believe that animals are experiencing emotions the way we are experiencing it. So it is, you know, to almost impose ourselves on animals or presume that their experiences are similar to our experiences, which, which can be slightly wrong because they could be having a different experience from ours. And uh, this could be a certain danger because it makes your work slightly uh, unscientific. Like uh, if you see uh, tear stains on an animal's face, it may not necessarily be feeling sorrow. It could be a different reason. It could be uh, anything, you know, which, which the animal is not able to communicate or explain to us. Right? But we presume because that is how it's with human beings. Right, right. right. And that is one of the dangers. You know? hmm, hmm, hmm. So you say that there are some... Uh, the drawbacks also if you there are some dangers also of putting it those uh, uh, looking at animals from yes, yes. Anthropomorphic. human point of view so so how do you naturalists and nature writers of krishnan's kind uh, thread this fine line between recording emotional states and being anthropomorphic or in other words, when do such descriptions remain within the purview of science? It's a very interesting question. You know, I think I wish I'd given more thought to it when I was writing. Like personally, I feel that you know, Krishna does not feel that anthropomorphism is entirely dangerous. Also, you know, that's a correction which I should offer. There could be certain forms of anthropomorphism which make you more empathetic towards animals. Like if you feel an animal, you, you believe that an animal is feeling pain the way you're feeling, you certainly don't want to put it through that pain. So an anthropomorphic uh, tendency could actually also build a certain relational, it can create a relational context between us and animals, and it can also foster empathy in many different ways. So he's not completely and entirely opposed to it. The second thing is, if you look at, he also provides a very beautiful example out of Sangam literature, which is again goes back a millennium. He says Sangam literature is largely uh, anthropocentric and you find that animals are largely anthropomorphized. You know, it is, it's largely the animals look very human. They seem to be having similar human experiences and traits and uh, uh, predilections. But despite this anthropomorphism which is running through the entire Sangam literature and legendary lore, he shows that you know, Sangam literature provides different poems which give very accurate descriptions of bird migration. So he is not necessarily opposed to literature also, which is probably slightly, you know, a lot of tendency towards anthropomorphism. But of course, it can make you slightly unscientific and it can kind of lead to a certain uh, presumption of what animals are going through. And you find that Krishna is always alert towards it. So he is alert towards it in the sense, uh, like I think the best way of showing why and how he is alert to it is to go back to Jekyll's. In which he says, so long as we do not presume that jackals hear the call of their kind exactly as we do, we are on sound ground in assuming the purpose of their words. So he is conscious that when we are making some sense out of why jackals sing or why jackals kind of cry out in a certain way, we have to be sure that they do not hear the call of their kind exactly as we do. They probably hear it differently as we do. So you find that, you know, Krishna is trying to arrest any excess tendency towards anthropomorphism in that sense. The other thing Krishna does when he's walking a fine line is that anthropomorphism can have an entirely negative side roads. Now, I've just spoken about certain positives and certain potentials of anthropomorphism. But negative could be when we stigmatize a certain animal. We believe a certain animal is revengeful, like a cobra. It remembers who uh, did what to its mate and then it comes out to take revenge. Or, you know, a certain notion that an animal is like a pest, it's diseased, it's vermin, it's meat, it's ugly. Or a certain animal which probably could be considered to be a cunning, like the cunning fox, you know. So these are certain forms of negative forms of anthropomorphism which Krishna is very keenly aware of. And he, he kind of tries to diffuse it in many different ways in his writing. So he's written specific pieces like on the vengeful cobra to show there's nothing vengeful about a cobra. He writes about, you know, certain animals which may be considered cunning. And shows they're not cunning in any which way. They're very astute. They're not cunning. They're astute. They're like citizens of the wild. You know? And uh, he may also completely abolish the tendency to regard an animal as vermin. Like the dhol, for example. Why, why should it be treated like vermin? It's got a very important place in the predator-prey relationship. Why should it be treated like a pest? 
why should you be treated like a lesser predator in comparison to a tiger in the patriarchal network? So, you know, these are ways in which he kind of diffuses negative forms of anthropomorphism. And this is how I feel he walks a very fine line, not completely dismissing anthropomorphism as some people have a tendency to do, particularly the school of post-humanism tends to do that. You know. and, uh, and at the same time, uh, not, not completely valorizing anthropomorphism also. This is the fine line which Krishna resolves. No, I, I I was just listening to you and uh, I, I have realized one point is very striking that not considering uh, it, that human attributes cannot be in, uh, present in any other animal is also kind of negation. It's a negation. So, it's a negation. Uh, so this negation probably is a problem to understand the world also. Yeah, so, so I, any black and white approach towards uh, anthropomorphism is, I think, of slightly flawed approach. It's an area of gray and you have to keep on asking ourselves questions in terms of where our tendency to anthropomorphize is taking us. Right. Right. So you speak of how his writings established a high standard, if not ethic, hmm. uh, for interspecies companionship between humans and animals of all kinds. Yes, 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 yes. So could you elaborate on this with one or two examples of from his writings that sure. may not have even included in your article. Oh, surely. I mean, I can uh, provide you some uh, interesting examples. So, like in the article, it says he's got this very clear, like in, interspecies uh, you know, companionship, he's got this very clear maxim. He says, if you really want to do something for animals, you really care for wildlife, particularly in regions where wildlife is still there in sufficient measure. He says, do nothing, just leave them alone. Just leaving wildlife alone is sufficient. Leave well alone is a proven maxim of wildlife conservation. He says this very clearly. It's a way of building companionship. It happens even in families. You know, if you really want to get along with someone, sometimes you have to simply give them that space. Like we use this word very often within our context. Like, like please give me some space. I'll be fine. Like if it happens in families. It can happen within a human family that there can be a certain amount of peaceful coexistence just by giving each other space. It can also happen with animals. You simply give them that space. Leave well alone is one maxim he has to follow. And in providing this maxim, he also offers another very interesting, which is not there in the article, that don't try to help them beyond a certain point also. Now, he takes your attention to uh, this whole program with the mugger, the crocodiles in the early 1980s, when they felt the numbers are reducing so fast, so they should have a captive breeding program to bring their numbers back to normalcy, or what they believed was uh, normalcy. Now, this thing when it became a complete menace because there was an excess number of crocodiles. And you could release these crocodiles because then it would have consequences for human safety. So what did the government do at that point of time? Is it said that uh, we will uh, launch a pilot project for the trade in crocodile skin, which can be tried out with a surplus stock of crocodiles. So first you have this captive breeding program, then the numbers increase. Now you don't know how to manage this mess. So what do you want to do? You want to go into trade. You want to trade these crocodiles. You want to turn them into items of trade. So this is a very uh, problematic thing which has happened in our neighboring countries like China. And he was one of the earliest persons to voice that today you're doing this with crocodiles. Tomorrow you'll do it with ivory and day after you'll do it with tigers. Which means all animals will become like poultry farm animals. So they become like uh, farm grown and they become like tradable objects. So to put a spoke into the wheel of such plans and such programs is what uh, Krishna did very effectively. And uh, so this is the different ideas he had in interspecies companionship, not to, to give animals their space, not to intervene unnecessarily. And the best part is that Krishna also drew attention to how villagers do it. This is another aspect in which people have not looked very carefully at. So he points out the role of villagers in creating the Vedantam Hill bird sanctuary. And uh, this is, you know, he takes you back to the 1930s when villagers had lobbied with the colonial administration to create the sanctuary in the 1930s. And uh, the second case he gives is of the Bishnois of Rajasthan, in which he speaks very highly of the Bishnois and he says, of, of the region we know as the, the Tal Chapar wild sanctuary today, he says, if you want to know how conservation can really be affected successfully in the field without fuss and bother by illiterate rustics through dedicated and sincere effort and the faith in the policy of leaving well alone, please go to Tal Chapar. So, you know, this is, he says, you really want to learn how to conserve an interspecies companionship. You don't necessarily have to turn to an expert. You don't have to turn to a so-called scientist or a conservationist. 
who may himself be sitting in Delhi or in some metropolitan city. You can learn this lesson of coexisting with nature from even villagers, which I think is a very remarkable thing which he painted. And uh, people have forgotten this uh, wisdom. So, how important do you think this ethic is in the context of where we are as a species today? It's very important, sort of. That's all I can say. It's, it's crucial and very important. You know, I mean, I have nothing more to say, but that it's very important. So, what do you think uh, teachers can draw from uh, Krishna's life and work uh, to build and nurture this ethic in themselves and in their learners? Uh, I think one of the main things is to become a disciple of nature, to become a lifelong disciple of nature. Unless teachers will not be willing to learn from nature, they cannot teach students anything about nature. So uh, I think one of the crucial lessons for any teacher is to, if he really wants to teach students anything about nature, is to first uh, become a pupil to nature, to become a disciple of nature, to learn from nature. So that is one thing. And he also draws different kinds. He feels there can be different lessons to be learned from nature. Not simply for teachers, but even for politicians or even for uh, administrators or for, for you know, anyone. For example, he gives the case of uh, monkeys and how we can learn from monkeys in terms of how we conduct our politics. Here. He says, uh, how two dominant monkeys may prefer to ignore each other when they are reasonably close to a fight and thus prove that democracy in an institution requires one to be unmindful of his individual indi individuality at times. So <laughs> he gives the example of two alpha monkeys who come very close to a fighting situation, but then just simply back off and ignore one another. And he says we can learn, democracy can learn much from such monkeys also. And how democracy as an institution requires one to be unmindful of his individuality at times. It could be an alpha male, it doesn't matter. Right, 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 right. <clears throat> it's a very interesting. So one of the most fascinating aspects of your article is focused on Krishna's relationship and the defense of elephants. You gave several examples. So as you suggest, uh, Krishna's field work helped show that the destruction attributed to elephants was the simple and inevitable consequence of deep, diverse, and sustained human penetrations. So, could you elaborate on this? How is that two sets of ecologists see the same animal and the same landscape, but uh, come to different conclusions? And uh, how are such conflicts resolved? This is, uh, I, mean, I find this very relevant in the sense, you know, sort of, that uh, you can analyze it from the vantage point of the present itself. If you uh, look at it from the present, you, you have this phenomenon of industry-sponsored science. So to give you an example, if a pharmaceutical corporation was to conduct a study on the side effects of its medicines, how honest do you think this corporation is actually going to be? So this is how you find pharmaceutical corporations coming out with very skewed studies on the side effects of their medications. These medications uh, going to the hands of the public and then we realize it many years down the line. There's a fantastic work called Toxic Bodies on Hormone Disruptors written by this lady called Nancy Langston. It's a very clear example of you know, how, how science can actually be, be manipulated by, by powerful corporations and uh, vested interests. And uh, the same thing happens even through seed corporations. You find seed corporations which are again and again trying to point out or trying to say, that you know, the sharing of seeds between farmers can be ruinous for local agriculture. They feel that spurious seeds will be shared by one farmer to the other and that destroys crops and it lowers agricultural productivity and seeds should only be bought from the market which is uh, fed by the corporation. Now you realize that sharing of seeds is actually the backbone of food sovereignty. It is the backbone of India's food security. But there are umpteen number of studies which want to prove otherwise. So science is not always neutral, it is not always objective, and it does not always speak on behalf of marginalized sections, be it human beings or let them be animals. So science has always been manipulable. And uh, an early example of this manipulation comes out of Krishna's work. So the forest department and uh, your development experts in the 1950s and 60s, this was the era of avid nation building which was unfolding. We needed lots of development and there was a strong focus on uh, state-sponsored development. And uh, this kind of somehow seemed to penetrate into the whole realm of wildlife sciences. 
and manipulate the science and turn what was a victim, the elephant, into the villain. And uh, because uh, if you really were concerned about the elephant, then larger territories would have to be earmarked for conservation. Because this is an animal which is very roving, it ranges across vast territories. So any care or expression of concern for this animal would mean that larger territories have to be earmarked or defined a sanctuary. But rather what they did is they turned this animal into a villain and began to say that very, it, it multiplies very fast, it uproots trees along its pathway and it populates tracts and it's kind of a menace and it destroys crops, it, it, it harasses human beings. This is a negative portrayal which came out of a study conducted by IUCN itself, which was the leading international organization for conservation at that point in time. International Union for Conservation, IUCN. And the study was carried out by a gentleman named R.H. Waller. And it made some very disparaging remarks against elephants and showed very clearly how an effort was being made to, uh, to kind of dilute conservation objectives and make greater space for rampant development. So at the cost of wildlife. So I think that's why... Uh, you mentioned that in defending elephants, uh, how Krishna's players often fell on deep ears. So, did he finally manage to convince the authorities? Uh, this is again a kind of you know, really a question which I think requires more retrospection in terms of precisely. But see, Krishna he, he won the, the the Jawahar Research Fellowship in 1968 to do research. So the fellowship given by the government, which means the government recognized some of his merits. They realized this was a man of some potential. He was also given the Padma Shri in 1970, which also goes to point that they, someone must have been hearing him to give him a Padma Shri at least. So I don't know if Padma Shri was just a way of pacifying this man, but uh, his material also kept on getting published in newspapers and uh, he enjoyed a certain amount of traction amongst the reading community. Now his uh, critique of Waller's study, which was sponsored by IUCN, was also published in the JBNHS, which was a leading journal at that point in time. JBNHS was also receiving a certain amount of patronage from IUCN, but they made space for Krishna's views. They felt that it's fine to have a certain amount of debate. And it was in criticism of Waller that you know he wrote a long, lengthy piece, uh, not very lengthy piece, but a very kind of potent and powerful piece. In this piece, he says, it is humanity and only humanity that has destroyed the habitat of wild elephants in the Bayanard region by setting up idle projects and all the concom and, and concomitant clearings and pylons and high voltage lines. By intensive exploitations of the forests, departmentally and by individual, by the sudden springing up of human settlements and agriculture, and by highways, there has been untold destruction of elephant country. No wonder the elephants rate crops growing in their old homes. So this was a very powerful statement which he made and it was given space. So which means people used to listen to him and there was a certain amount of, there was a certain amount of uh, respect for the man and the views he was expressing. But whether it brought about a policy change or not is of course highly questionable. And I don't think it brought about a policy change. They accommodated him. They perhaps even listened to him. But whether it translated into active change in terms of policy on the ground, I doubt. And the, the, the best thing which kind of instances this is, a uh, certain few lines which Krishnan wrote much later. He said, uh, with some sense of disappointment, all I have achieved by way of my writing, in spite of my almost unique opportunities for fair comments, is to get myself pushed out of the back door of the IBWF, which is the Indian Board of Wildlife. This was the key body which was making most of the policies with regard to wildlife. So he says, I got pushed out of the back door of the IBWF in a very quiet way. So quietly that it was six months after the event that I myself got to, knew, got to know that I'm no longer a member of the IBW. So <clears throat> you find that even if he was being heard, his articles were getting published, he was getting a Padma Shri. There was no active change in policy. And even in uh, policy think tanks such as the IBW and the Indian Board of Wildlife, he was ejected out of these bodies. Right, right. So Krishnan brought to our attention the risk that the most widely used economic model of development Opposed to other species in this context. True. Uh, he speaks of local extinctions, uh, silent extinctions, flagship species, healthy ecosystems. So, what do these terms mean uh, for uh, for clarity? What does this do? All these terms mean. Actually, sort of. This is a 
frankly i must apologize <clears throat> if it didn't come across very clearly in my writing out of all these terms the only term which krishnan actually used properly in the article it is local extinction and uh, local extinction he was referring to black bucks and leopards and the disappearance of both these species in select locales or select geographies so they vanish out of certain geographies but they continue to be found in other geographies so their extinction is only local it's highly localized it's not complete and not total so that is the term he means by local extinction silent extinction is of course you no know, term which i am using which is generally being used in conservation sciences now and it is you know how certain species can actually die without without gaining any attention from the scientific community so they say the giraffe is a very classic case in the case of uh, of of of, of uh, africa where it's not not extinct but it is heading towards silent extinction somehow the scientific community does seem to be kind of writing papers or writing publishing material or saying anything about the disappearance of this animal it's happening in a very silent way and this is also being told by indian uh, indian forester senior forester like ranjit sen mk ranjit sen who was a uh, senior forester in the 70s and 80s uh, so i think yeah please I, i forget the time when he was served but he wrote this very important book called beyond the tiger and recently in some of his uh, journalistic pieces which have appeared in newspapers he's tried to show that while we are fixated on certain animals we want to conserve the tiger we want to conserve this certain species we forget about certain small species like the indian pangolin or like the dugong or or uh, the slender loris whose numbers could be very few and very less actually and they seem to be inching way close to extinction uh, without our awareness or our concern as well and uh, flagship species is again a term which is more recent and it is a slightly propagandist term where we use uh, you know a kind of what would you say we use a particular species to uh, to uh, to enlist public participation in conservation so a certain species which is already popular amongst the public is used as a starting point for conservation like a tiger can be a flagship species because it is already very popular amongst the public tourists want to see it and uh, the danger with this kind of approach is that you begin with very uh, popular demands and end with popular demands animals which are not popular can completely get lost in the, in the larger picture you know? and uh, healthy ecosystems again is generally we refer to ecosystems where there is a stable soil and there is a proper nutrient transfer and there is a robust plant growth and you know and can take a certain amount of shock uh, it's resilient so these are some of the features of a healthy ecosystem which, which again i have used so barring local extinction i have the other terms are largely terms which i have used right 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 so uh, you uh, oh, what could you sh- uh, could you share some ex- simple uh, practical ways uh, in which teachers can introduce students to uh, the methods of obs- uh, methods and observations uh, by which ecologists uh, study and record such phenomena uh, uh, i have a uh, suggestion like this see i've not really done this kind of work no sort of but uh, i can probably generally say that not everything may be possible for a school teacher to do school teachers in any case are burdened with a lot of lot of demands you know so for them to kind of also develop as conservationists and to be able to teach students it may not always be possible within the school system what may work is some sort of a collaboration with say a neighboring college where you may be having a professor in biology or in zoology who may be able to pitch in or probably say with local ecologists he may not be a trained ecologist he may be a local ecologist but may have local knowledge about the entire flora and fauna or even you know collaborating with a neighboring university or or a university which is not very far and you're touching base with phd scholars who are doing work you may learn through the university that a certain scholar is doing researching those very issues in that very geography itself you know so i personally feel the way out for a school teacher in these kind of respects would be to create a certain network with colleges locally colleges to get in touch with people to get in touch with universities and uh, to become a part of this network as a student himself so there could be a possibility that he can also learn from this network along with the students and to facilitate the process generally of such kind of a network and uh, not to omit the fact that even a local community like we've seen in the case of tarachapar which uh, krishnan himself spoke about even a local community can probably educate the students and it could be even more wonderful if students are from that very community so who knows uh, the child himself is from a bishnoi community or belongs to a certain community which has, which has done some work for conservation in that region so uh, to kind of look for partners beyond the school framework or the school system would probably be one way out 
and okay. another note of caution would be that when they begin to proceed in such a way to also be skeptical of conservation priority like uh, like i was talking about uh, local uh, silent extinction uh, there could be a fixation with a certain species uh, you know the general climate is such that everyone wants to conserve a tiger or certain certain species and we ignore the less charismatic animals so we should always be wary of conservation priority as it exists and not say that okay fine if everyone is saying that this is the priority we should also follow and believe in that priority which is where uh, i i quote in that article of mine that when even the decline of the tiger which has captured human imagination in india for some 200 years was noticed only at the last stage it is only logical that the decline of less glamorous animals like the lion tailed macaque the sloth bear the hyena the wolf and the dinky little indian fox has gone largely unnoticed so uh, to proceed through networks and to also be skeptical of existing conservation priority so that we can accommodate less charismatic animals that could be one okay so yeah so this uh, something is possible uh, so you shared situations where krishnan would protest against measures like uh, what would cause harm to other species yes. so this is seen for example in the accounts you share of his views on cows dogs and even ele elephants so these instances seem to suggest that krishna's uh, krishna's interest in the natural world extended beyond curiosity to a deep sense of ecological justice so and interestingly in each of these cases krishna would encounter these approaches with scientific arguments so what are your thoughts on this you're right uh, sorob that uh, he was very particularly concerned about any kind of hurt which was caused to animals and uh, his entire concern for animals grows into an agenda of ecological justice and uh, <clears throat> his notion of ecological justice is again if you look at it very carefully a little anthropocentric in the sense he feels that even animals should be treated like citizens you know citizenship is largely an anthropocentric concept which we are taking towards animals so you can say there is a certain amount of anthropomorphism here also but in a very positive sense you know? and uh, he goes to a concept of patriotism patriotism is basically what that we are patriotic about our land a certain geography which we identify as our own and it's a sentiment which is shared by people across the globe so he's uh, referring to human beings he says we call it patriotism when it moves us and glorify it with evocative song with anthem and with flag these are all the symbols of patriotism but in wild creatures this feeling is too narrow and earthbound to appeal to us so when the animals such as elephants are very patriotic in the sense they are attached to their territories and they exhibit that attachment then it does not appeal to us so you see the fantastic critique which is affected within these two lines within these two sentences on our concept of patriotism it is so narrow when it comes to our patriotism our love for our territory and our motherland we we'll celebrate it with anthem and flag and song but when it comes to animals when we look at the attachment of the elephant to a certain geography or track it doesn't hold any appeal for us why is it so so it's just again one of those questions which he leaves open ended again this is something for you to think about i think this is how he pushed an agenda for for the ecological justice uh, nearly almost you know like a citizenship right so in your opinion how can teachers create an upbuilding environment for students to understand the science society relationships from a justice and fairness active uh, perspective perspective uh if you look at it that way sort of it's uh, in the sense i feel uh, here this requires a, really, uh, a moment of honesty if you really want to you know kind of promote these concepts of justice and fairness then teachers will actually have to call a spade a spade which is not be easy all all time you know just like krishnan called a spade a spade it is for us to recognize and put before students what is unjust we cannot have a concept of justice unless you told the students what is unjust so you know the problem in some of the texts or textbooks is the student doesn't get a sense of what the injustice is or has a very narrow understanding of what the injustice towards animals actually is and he cannot really conceive and come to an understanding of justice so to deliberate and discuss what is injustice towards animals and to deliberate and discuss what is unfair to animals 
these kind of discussions in the classroom will actually automatically become the, the springboard from where we can actually conceive, we can, we can conceive and deliberate notions of justice and fairness. But uh, to say what is unjust, what is wrong, uh, requires a certain act of courage where we want to call a spade a spade, you know. And sometimes calling a spade a spade can end up brushing people the wrong way also. That is, that is right, right. <clears throat> so increasingly we are aware of the need to introduce students to their local environment. And in this context, Krishnan raised many concerns and about school education and its approach to the natural world. Uh, for example, in his essay titled Nature Study, Krishnan criticized what he refers to as the concentric system of learning. So seeing how students are introduced to more and more of the same thing in subsequent grades and maybe easy to catch. Many teachers in our audience uh, today may be able to look at the textbooks they are working with and identify other such examples. But Krishnan does not stop here. He points out uh, that the same error could happen if the curriculum or teacher got fixated on a certain model or theory of understanding the natural world. So could you give us an example of what Krishnas may have uh, meant by this? Uh, <clears throat> so just going back to his uh, problem with the concentric model, <clears throat> and there is a there is a paragraph which appears and in, in the article as well, sort of, in which he says in the first year the child learns that the cow has four legs, quadruped, gives us milk and eats grass, herby wool. The next year maybe there is a lesson on milk and another on how the cow is a mammal. And then in the fourth grade, the young naturalist learns how the cow chews cut and that its stomach is cut up into compartments. So what he means by a concentric system is that you go on concentrating on the same small observation, go on go on needling into a very small observation again and again. It almost creates a scenario of frogs in a well, you know, where you're not looking beyond a very small arena of research or inquiry. And the true complexity of nature completely evades you. So uh, it can give you a very false sense of confidence that you're looking at the same thing constantly and consistently, so consistently enough that you begin to think you're an expert in it. But you're only looking at a very small speck in a larger frame. You know. And uh, this false sense of uh, Confidence doesn't really take you the long distance, and uh, we may just end up feeling proud of knowing very little. And this this pride doesn't hold us in good stead if you have to understand nature. Either. So this is uh, this is what you know, Krishna and the problem which he had, and uh, it is uh, again I don't know if it didn't come across in my article, but uh, Krishna doesn't provide any parallel examples of this concentric system, and I, I leave it as a question for teachers whoever is listening to this talk. And uh, the teachers were a part of this uh, this whole discussion to actually put their minds to look at the curriculum and see if they find other such examples of the concentric system in their textbooks. Now I'm not very sure, but I've not looked at some of the textbooks or looked at them very critically or very, or very kind of uh, in, in a very up close manner. But when I was growing up, I felt something very similar used to happen with the food chain thesis. So I studied the food chain thesis in the sixth standard from uh, what my uh, to the best of my memory. And the food chain thesis would again come up in the seventh, and then it would again come up in the eighth grade. And finally, when you're entering into the biology lab, the bio lab, you would always have this chart of, chart of the food chain thesis and it would be explained afresh over there. So this kind of fixation with just one theorem and looking at it again and again and believing that we understood the whole of nature by simply looking at predator prey relationships or simply you know looking at a food chain thesis, the pyramidical structure which we have in mind, could be another example. That's that's one example which I have in mind. I could be completely wrong also. But there could be other such examples which are strewn across school textbooks. And it is important to identify such instances. So, right. So, uh, Krishnan suggests uh, two alternatives to the concentric system of learning about the natural world. So, in your article, you mentioned that one alternative is to take children more and more into the open then he suggests could take more than one form. For example, schools can maintain a market garden, uh, poultry run, goat pen, pigeon loft, middle-sized school dog. So he also suggests taking students for regular field visits to forests by teachers who are willing to learn from the natural world. So would you like to elaborate on this? How do you think we as adults uh, can remain open to learning? 
directly from our experience of the nature environment? Uh, I would precisely stick to what Krishnan says, uh, Saurav, in the sense uh, having probably a middle-sized school dog, a pigeon loft, a goat pen, and taking students out into the open. And uh, these are just, you know, I think a, a wonderful uh, pointers in terms of you know, what teachers can do. The only additional thing which I would kind of recommend or probably suggest is when uh, teachers are doing all this to look very carefully at how younger generation students or children interact with uh, non-human animals. To observe very carefully how children can be very open towards animals. To look at that childlike curiosity which is there, you know, and to become and to be willing to be infected by it. So, so not simply to take take children as as, as uh, children who have to be kind of educated about nature. But also to look at children in their interactions with wildlife or interactions with nature. Look at them very closely and see what we can learn as adults or teachers from them, quote unquote teachers from them. So uh, to actually kind of reverse our positions, you know, where we look at children also as teachers and we come into the position of learning. Right. That like when they play with the school dog, you know, what kind of descriptions they provide. When they look at a goat, what, what comes in their mind? Or when when you take them out into the open, how do they respond to different forms of natural phenomena? How do they express it? Uh, and how do they express their curiosities, you know, their inquisitiveness? I think we should be open to that as well. And that could be a very enriching experience for us as teachers. Very true. So you mentioned other alternatives. In Krishnan, uh, the Krishnan recommends, uh, uh, recommendation is about specifically about uh, choosing or designing books for children. Uh, he suggests uh, that children would uh, really uh, would readily insert themselves in any text if it was free from morals and illustrated in color. So, have you seen some examples of such books, and uh, how do you think they shape our relationship with the natural world? Mm. Uh, tell you honestly, I'm, I'm not uh, aware of any such books. Uh, so my, my, I'm not really been very uh, keenly attuned to you know, kind of working at the school level. Would love mm -hmm. to, but uh, would love to kind of explore that entire arena. But uh, I'm not aware of such books. And uh, I personally feel that you see, I, uh, I feel a teacher should be a great storyteller. You know? If a teacher can even take one story, like you know, one story out of Krishna's corpus. The best thing about Krishnan is you don't have to read him back to back. You don't have to pick up one book and begin with the first page and end with the last page. So you can actually open any book by Krishnan in between and find a small passage or a small piece and meditate and contemplate on it and to absorb the entire essence of that piece. And then to be able to share it with students, you know, to be able to explain it and express it to students in the form of story. That itself could be uh, great. And I feel some of the best books we have are also written in the form of stories. And uh, I feel that was Krishna's ability you know, to observe natural phenomena and to offer it in the form of a potent story, a captivating story, which is interesting and illuminating at the same time. You know. So uh, a teacher perhaps can try to read Krishna and try to try to kind of just uh, be the book. You know, so, so that's what I would say. Right. So your article. Uh, on all that Krishnan accompli accomplished uh, through his life uh, and work, uh, despite being an average student, is a source of inspiration for. For uh, so, what do you think uh, teachers and educators can learn from his life? Uh, how do we nurture and support uh, students of different capabilities? So they realize their true potential as sensitive, relentlessly curious, and courageous human beings. Yeah. So, uh, so I think it uh, this you know this kind of kind of closes the loop you know sort of because it takes us back to a kind of similar question right in the beginning. And uh, I feel the three lessons I just kind of I'm just reiterating what I've said previously that you know first of all to be very kind to backbenchers. <laughs> To be very kind to students who are not who do not come across instantly as competitive, and uh, to kind of make sure that you know we don't dismiss students who are not running the rat race. We could have enormous potential in terms of becoming environmentalists. So that is one thing. And uh, the second thing, of course, is to recognize, like I told earlier, also that uh, an interest in a given field, specialization and excellence in a given field, 
need not begin from within that field itself. It could begin from a very different discipline, which is rather disconnected from the discipline in which the student may excel in the future. So he could begin with literature and arts, or probably looking at flora, and then gradually become an expert in wildlife, so it's possible. So not to kind of restrict students' choices right in the initial stages by looking at their initial merit. So just because a student is scoring very highly in geography to say that he'll become a geographer, it need not be so. He can probably go from geography to biology tomorrow. And there may be some resonance of geography that spills into biology. It could be possible that he has got a more profound understanding of biology because he comes from a geography background. The same thing which happens with Krishna, his literary background, his style of writing, it really makes him a very nuanced observer of nature at the same time. There is a very strong dialectics between his writing, writing as a craft, and observing as a naturalist. So these things make us, uh, could be the, the, the grain of success in case of student. And the third thing is to cultivate students who ask questions. To be happy that if a student is asking you a question, you should really be, uh, take it as a sign that you're, you're, you're a good teacher. And uh, uh, should be also open to avid disagreement from the students. So I think these are the key lessons. I'd said this uh, probably initially also. But uh, basically, these are three key lessons which we can derive out of Krishna as a teacher. So, yeah, there's a lots of learning from it. So, I think uh, we uh, we have the several uh, uh, a couple of questions appeared in the audience section, and uh, now we don't have many questions, so we are not going to question answer. Uh, session. Uh, but one thing that is very interesting, Barun, uh, it was uh, that the, every century we are becoming faster and faster. With the new machine world, we are becoming faster and faster. Transportation is getting faster and faster. But what we have seen to understand nature, you have to be slow, slow. I, I would not say slower, but it's a slow. But when we go slow, uh, we understand things better, so we don't know in the in the hurryness of fast becoming faster and faster in the process of development. Are we understanding less? And if we understand less, how long will develop? So, or what will be that development? So, I think uh, the way you have written this and you have introduced Krishnan to us, it is fascinating. So, Baru, and all of you have joined us today. Thank you. Uh, we may not have been able to uh, take all your questions, and for this we apologize. Uh, you have, uh, if you have any pressing questions for the author, please send them to us uh, at i wonder at apu dot edu dot uh, We'll do our best to get them answered. And join us again for our next webinar on the February 14, 2024 at 4.30 p.m. Note, 4.30 p.m. And for all those who have not subscribed to I Wonder yet, uh, we hope uh, to do so now. So thank you. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Varun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.